back to a video featuring my disembodied hands. Please excuse the uh, noise of the compressor in the background, if you can hear that, hopefully it's not going to cause too much of a, a disturbance. This video I want to talk about these things, multiply picks. Now I've made quite a few of these, I've had quite a lot of fairly positive feedback, which I'm very grateful for, from people in the pick community and from customers, where I basically take a a piece of material and sandwich it between some other pieces of material. Mirror with kyrenite is quite a common uh, common choice or mirror with acrylic or kyrenite and acrylic or just different types of acrylic. They all look quite pretty and I had a, a discussion with a potential customer a couple of weeks ago where they were wanting a bespoke uh, pick making. It was going to be a, basically a variation on one of these multiply things and we had a, a discussion and they kind of went f very lukewarm about the whole thing when we got onto the issue of price and they thought what I was charging was just way too much and I f thought what I wanted to do was do a, a, a video to kind of show what goes into making a pick like this uh, a few different reasons firstly so if anybody ever questions me on price again I can say look this is the amount of work that goes into one of these things you know they're all handmade time is money that's why these things cost what they are. You know, you can't look at a, a handmade three ply pick with all the work that goes into it and expect to pay 50p, you know, like you would for just a, a standard celluloid pick over the counter at your local guitar store. And secondly, as one or two other pick makers have commented on my on my picks, particularly on Instagram, it's like, wow, that's you know the, look, the picks look really good and been quite interested in, in what the actual process is so I thought one other benefit of this video is I can use it to share um, the technique as I'm not precious about how I, how I work I thought kind of show how picks are made and if it inspires you to try something similar then uh, that would be good so let's get those out of the way and talk about what we could be making a pick from today I'm going to make a, a pick three ply pick and I've already decided on my piece of material for the middle so I've got my box of box of goodies because I know in my box of goodies I've got some glow in the dark acrylic like that so really really quite good so if I uh, put that under a under a light for a second and then I uh, I turn off the lights A lovely glow to it. So that's going to be the core of the pick. What am I going to put on the faces? Well I've looked at a few different bits and bobs. I could just use a piece of kyrenite but I've got a piece of acrylic that I got and um, like this marble effect like white acrylic. Is it, yeah kind of marbly I don't know how you call it. Coral sort of effect probably is a better word for it. So I think what I'm going to do is make a pick with that glow in the dark in the core and this uh, acrylic material on the faces so it's a three ply affair so first thing to do is we'll mark out uh, a piece of the glow in the dark material cut that and then use that as a template one thing i discovered in making picks like this is you can't just put three pieces of material together, glue them, and then cut them. Because as the saw is going backwards and forwards, uh, shaping the pick, it just puts too much stress on the joints. You've kind of got to build these things up. So what I'm going to do is take a piece of material, cut it to shape, and file it down to the shape of the pick that I want. Then I'm going to glue it onto this material and cut around that so I've got like a two ply pick and then glue that two ply pick onto the material again to get this th the third side of the pick. You'll see as we go along. So the first thing we need to do is to mark out on uh, on this piece of material the, uh, the shape of the pick. So what I'm going to do is just start off by roughing this up on a piece of sandpaper. Two reasons for that. Firstly by roughing the edges up I get a much better um, key for the glue because we're going to use an epoxy adhesive like araldite or gorilla glue or something uh, Luke, I can't remember what type of glue I've got in the uh, in the toolbox at the minute but uh, you know the sort of thing I mean it's one of those like two part two part glues that you rub together 
that you, uh, it's one of those two part glues that you mix together and um, forms a very, very strong bond. So I'm just gonna rough that up. And by roughing it up, it means I've got a nice matte surface that's gonna show the pencil mark when I mark the uh, the shape of the pick that I'm going to cut out. So for, for this one, I think I'm going to do what I call my classic model, which is basically a standard 351 sort of shape and size. Um, I say sort of because I tend to go for a slightly sharper tip than you get. So this is quite a slightly rounded tip on, uh, on this pick. I'm going to go for something slightly longer. And as you will have noticed, I've got a clock running. So I'm going to, every, all the time that I'm actually doing anything productive, I'm going to keep the clock running and see what the cumulative time is for all of this. Uh, if I stop just to explain what it is I'm doing, I'll stop the clock because I want to try and get a, a true representation of the amount of work that goes into a pick such as this. So I'll mark around this pick just as a template, but I know that I'm going to cut a little bit sharper. You'll see as we go on. And also I need to cut out a couple of pieces of uh, this material that I'm going to use for, for gluing on. So while, while I've got the saw out I might as well cut all of those as well. So I'll rough up some of this material um, just to mark off roughly, roughly where, where I'm going to be cutting and uh, we can take it from there. So I need something roughly that sort of shape. Yeah, it needs to be rough because I need to get a key with the glue. So having a, a, sand, a sanded surface is much better for that. I'm going to cut pieces bigger than I need. I don't like gluing onto like my, my main piece of material because the glue spooges and, and the material comes like difficult to work with. And, uh, it's just not good. It's, I'd, I'd rather have a little bit of waste. So if I want a piece roughly that sort of shape to, to cut with, because when I'm gluing, there'll be a little bit of slippage. So as long as I make sure I've got a piece big enough to uh, to, to cut to, uh, to to glue to for that. And where else is going to be efficient? Sort of, I guess about this sort of this sort of this sort of shape, I guess. So if I cut, yeah, cut something like that sort of shape. Looks kind of scrappy, but you'll see what I mean when I get them cut. Okay, let's uh, reposition the camera, get the uh, material into a vise and uh, get cutting. Right then, I'm not used to filming with a, a, with a vise, but hopefully you can see what's going on. Uh, so I've got the vise here. There's the material marked up, so we're going to start just cutting that down to uh, to, sh to roughly to shape. Get that in. Now I work completely by, by hand, and I just always just use a coping saw uh, rather than any sort of like electric saws or bench saws or anything like that. Um, let's get going. <laughs> Hopefully this isn't causing the camera to bounce around too much. Okay, so that gives us the uh, core of the pick, the glow-in-the-dark material, and a couple of pieces of the marbly acrylic which we're going to use for the, the faces okay let's get the camera moved again and um, get on with the next stage back at the uh, the main part of the workbench what i'm going to do now is get the file and just basically go around the edges and get this core piece of the pick down to the shape and size that we need it to be for the finished article So basically taking the uh, shape of the pick down to to that pencil line, not 
not beyond I want to have a little bit just a little bit of extra material around the edges so by going up to, up to the pencil line um, rather than through it uh, means I've got a little bit of wriggle room so when I'm filing the like the, the compound piece down with the composite piece with both of the uh, faces on if I take a little bit of the core material off it means I'm not taking it down to, to too small a size if you see what I mean of course this material that I'm working with as I say is glow in the dark green so it'll be interesting the fine powder gets everywhere so out of interest yes when I'm doing this I do tend to wear a face mask because I don't like the the idea of tiny little particles of plastic getting up my up my nose and in my mouth and into my lungs and doing all sorts of nasty things to my insides the interesting thing is with this being blue in the dark I know all the bits of dust that get into, uh, into my clothes so it's freezing cold I've got a sweater on I know that the the, the texture of the wool will be picking up all sorts of glow-in-the-dark material and if I turn the light out my, uh, my sweater will glow in the dark as well but here we go so that's near enough I think the shape and size that we're going for so we'll fine-tune it all when we do the, the final, final pick um, yeah it's it's slightly over, but that is good. So mark, rub off the uh, the pencil lines. I don't want those persisting because they will show through. Uh, but apologise if I keep going out of shot. I'm not used to working with a like a camera like this. So what next? Well, what we're going to do now is take one of these pieces of uh, material for the faces. And what I'm going to do is make sure I've got both sides of this this glow in the dark material properly sanded so it doesn't matter which one I put down it's going to be nice and sanded and rough so I've got a good key with the glue So I'll just make sure that the edges are nice and flat. There's no sharp bits around the edge from where I was filing. Okay. So this is one of our pieces of the make sure that's sanded down properly. So we get as good a key onto that as possible. So we're going to cover that in glue, stick it to that, and clamp it. So, um, glue, clamps, etc. Glue. So it's Gorilla Glue Epoxy Clear. Some gloves because it does get a bit messy. A clamp, and a couple of things just for holding the holding the, uh, the pick and the uh, piece of material in, the, in the, the clamp. So what I'm going to do is start with a bit of uh, masking tape. Cut the masking tape into a little bit of a loop. Stick it on there. I'll just stick that down. And I'll do the same on the other, other clamping core. Put down. So what we're going to do, like I say, is glue that, stick it to there, that on top, and clamp it. So, start off. Get your gloves on, because this can be rather messy stuff to work with. So it's neat Need something just to, to mix up in. And I don't need a lot of this, so this is literally just enough to cover one side of that. 
And the way this works is you've got a resin and a hardener. And so squeeze out, hopefully, in, you can see this in equal quantities. Being quite careful because I don't want, I don't need too much of this and I don't want to be wasteful. So that tiny amount for what we're doing today should be plenty enough. So we'll just mix that together. So 30 seconds to a minute of good mixing action. The, the stuff is really weird. The, both the resin and the hardener are super, super sticky on their own. And they never, it seems like if you, if you spill them or you get them anyway, they're never on their own, they're never truly set. But if you mix them together like this, it's like a chemical reaction between the two. It's slightly exothermic because it gets quite warm. Um, but they the kind of react together and I mean, even as you're mixing it up, you can feel it starting to start to harden, become less pliable. But as it, as it goes off, it sets very, very hard. And this particular one sets quite cl sets clear as well, which is um, nice. If there's any any sort of like visible seam, it's clear, so it's not too obvious. That shouldn't be a problem here. So take a pick, pick pick shape a piece of plastic. and basically cover that in the epoxy. So it didn't mix up a lot. We don't need a lot. We don't need to completely slather the thing in glue because they're going to compress this in a in a in a clamp which will squeeze that quite thin. We don't you, you don't squeeze so like it's too tight because you end up you squeeze all the glue out. You know, you need you need some glue in there will hold everything together, but it does need to be clamped reasonably tight. So we take that, we line that up on a piece of plastic, making sure that everything that should be in contact is in contact, which is good. Plonk that on top, get our clamp. Clamp it down like that. Just check that it hasn't slipped and it's all within the uh, white piece of plastic. So yeah, take that, squeeze it so it's got a good uh, good contact, but not like say squeezing the living daylights out of it. It doesn't need to be like super, super tight. That needs to sit for, well, be honest, I usually give it 24 hours so it's as, as hard as it can possibly be. And so we'll leave that um, and come back to it later. Right then, it's now tomorrow, so let's get everything unclamped and see how it looks. So here we are, there's the original piece of the glow in the dark material uh, glued in. It did slip slightly. It's a little bit closer to the edges than I would have liked, but it's not uh, it's not slipped off, so that's fine. Next thing to do is get that in the vise, and we'll cut off the excess, get it down to so roughly pick shaped again, and then we can repeat the exercise to do the other face. Like I say, need to do it so I'm only cutting through one piece of material at a time, otherwise it just weakens the. Uh, or it puts a lot of stress rather on the on the glue joint, and I don't like doing that. So into the vise and it's just a case of going around. This is a little bit easier because we can use the uh, the right shaped uh, pick blank as a bit of a guideline. So we're just basically going to cut off the excess and then we can get down and start filing. Filing the, uh, the whole thing up to the right shape. So take this back to the bench and just file off that little bit of excess around the edges.
Okay, so back at the bench. Now we're just going to take the file and get rid of the excess around there. Get this down to so the face that we've just glued on is pretty much the same shape and size as the piece that we started with. I find it's easier to go through a bit of filing at this stage and end up, if you like, with a two ply pick that's the right shape and size before we glue in the third bit. Um, it just makes the whole shaping process easier if you're only filing solely one, one layer at a time. Maybe a little bit of extra work, but uh, overall I find it's it's an easier way to, to do things. This doesn't have to be super precise. We're going to go through and do the final, like shaping, filing and shaping when we'll put the third layer on. But uh, getting roughly there at this stage is uh, is useful. I think that's close enough for now. A um, little bit, a little bit of non-uniformity, but it's good enough for where we need to be right now. So, it's going to get the sandpaper and make sure that that side, that side is nice and rough. Get rid of any sharp edges that I've introduced while I was filing. that we're going to be gluing on. So yeah, I think I sanded this sanded this last time. Just give it another quick quick once over. So both sides that we're going to be gluing are sanded so we get a good a good key with the uh, for the glue to, to grip onto. Okay so we're just going to basically repeat what we did last time get some glue onto onto this clamp it up and uh, where we go so uh, yeah let's get the let's get the glue okay, i'm just going to mix up the glue i'll get everything set up ready to go make sure i know which way around i'm going to fix this on yes yeah, so it's going to be oops it's going to be that way a little bit tight but yeah that'll go That's it. Like I said last time, we don't need a huge amount of this glue. So I'll just try to squeeze out just enough that we need not to be wasteful. And uh, get it mixed up. I feel that's starting to, starting to, uh, I can feel that's starting to, to thicken, get a little stiffer. So. I think that's ready to go on. Get a scoop of that onto the spatula, onto the apply applicator, and just spread that onto the pick. Again, we want to get full coverage, but we don't need to be super thick with it because it will be going under a clamp, which will squeeze it out. A little bit and we don't want it spooging everywhere so as long as we make sure the surfaces are completely covered right up to the edges that will do so take that pop it on there get it lined up i'm just going to try and slide around a little bit to make sure space all the way around put that on there just to spread the weight and get the clamp clamp that up again squeeze it tight but not not to within an inch of its life 
we don't want it squeezed so tight that the, we basically squeeze all the glue out there needs to be a little bit of glue in there just go around make sure it hasn't slipped out there's a little bit of space around all the edges which there is okay put that off to one side and leave it for 24 hours um, come back tomorrow and uh, finish the job right then day three take the work in progress out of the clamp and basically where where we are yesterday uh, except we've got three layers of, of pick now so get this onto the onto the vise cut off the excess then and start filing it and this is where it gets more into the territory of actually making a pick it starts to feel a lot more pick like now so uh, okay let's get this over to the vise and start cutting all right so I'll get this into the vise Pretty sure very little of the stuff that I shoot at the vice is going to be usable because the camera is going to be vibrating too much, but uh, here goes. Okay. So there's something looking fairly pick-like. Just need to get the edges filed, get the basic shape, and then we can start beveling. So back to the main workbench. Okay, so the bench now, break out the file and just go around and take all these little edges off, get rid of the little bits of spooged glue around the edges and get this basically to a blank pick. Obviously I'm sure this would be a lot quicker I was working with some sort of power tool like a bench grinder or a Dremel or something like that but I've tried working with a Dremel and to be honest I found when it, the Dremel's going fast it kind of it's difficult to work with it's almost like it starts to, to melt the the plastic rather than making it something you can work with and um, I just like working with with hand tools it's, it's, it's more labor intensive but uh, it just works better for me So as well as making sure that the pick is basically the right shape that way and you know, making sure that it's nice and even um, front to back because this is for some of the temptation when I'm filing to have the file moves at a slight angle um, so I just need to make sure that I've got it got a nice and uniform in all dimensions okay, that's looking pretty good I think I'm going to do now just to, to check is get like the pick that I'm using as a template so we've got the 351 shape pick here just put that against the, the piece of work um, line it up yeah that's pretty pretty close could use a little tiny tiny amount off here but I am pretty close I think Now a design decision that I need to make is how I handle the beveling on this. There's two ways I can I can do the beveling. I can take the file in at 45 degrees, put a bevel on, then kind of do the rounding where it needs to be rounded. Or I can do a smoother bevel where I kind of take the file over and more of a semicircular motion. Either works. Um, I've been using the, the more rounded style quite a bit recently on some picks that I've been making but for this one I think I'm going to go for the, the 45 degree one I just think it's going to work better on a pick of this thickness now this is feeling quite nice in the hand I will probably it's later in this in the process take a little bit of material off front and back just to make the whole thing a little bit thinner um, but that is usually easier once I've put the bevel on because it just means there's, there's only the sort of like the surface area around the grip part rather than all of this and um, it's just a little bit quicker to do it that way so what I'm going to do now is uh, crack on and start putting the bevel on to form the, the tip of the pick and form around the edges and then we can get into sanding and polishing and all that stuff later on but uh, yeah next stop 
the initial beveling for the tip. Well, that was really annoying. I've uh, beveled the, the, the front side here and I realised that the camera wasn't actually recording, which is really annoying. Fortunately, I had a, a stopwatch running, so I've got a rough idea how long that uh, that took, so I can update the uh, the clock so like after the event. However, I've only done one side uh, before I noticed that the uh, the camera wasn't running. So if I flip it over, I can show you on this side how that was done. So basically going in with a file at a 45 degree angle, just working towards the tip, just with forward strokes I find is easiest first just to get the uh, to get the bulk and the material away. And what we're looking for is a 45 degree chamfer bevel, whatever you want to call it. It goes halfway through the thickness of the pick to meet the 45 degree chamfer bevel on the other side. Now doing that it always takes a bit more material off towards the tip so just make sure that I'm also taking a little bit off back here as well. This is just an initial rough cut really. I'll uh, fine file and, and sand but basically what I'm looking to do here is just get the basic the basic shape of the uh, of the bevel. Do the same around on the other side. I'm not ambidextrous. It'd be nice to be able to do this on the push because I find a push is a more comfortable uh, stroke, but I can't. I'm right handed. So this one, a little less comfortable, but start on the pull, get some material off, and then I can start to do the. I can file in either direction. But again, it's the same thing, just looking to get a, a 45 degree angle down to halfway, halfway down the pick. And in this case, because I've already done one side, we're basically looking to meet to meet that halfway. Okay, so there's the, the basic shape really coming together. What's nice about this with it having the glow in the dark material is you start to do a reveal of that that glowing material around the edges of the um, of the faces. So what I'm going to do just for the, the hell of it, just turn the lights out. You should be able to see kind of that big glow material starting to reveal itself and that uh, face material is sort of like semi semi transparent so there's a little bit of um, a little bit of a, a glow comes through that. Another reason why I think I might take a little bit of material off the faces later makes the pick a bit more comfortable in the hand. It'll be a wee bit thinner. I'm, I'm going for something about the six, six and a half millimeter sort of thickness, but because that face material will be thinner, the other reason I want to do to, uh, to take some material off is a little, little, a little bit more of that glow through. Okay, so that's the it's like the the front and beveling sort of done towards the tip. What I want to do now is go around the other, the, the back side or the top side of the pick, depending which way you look at it, and basically put a rounded edge on here. We're not going to bevel all the way around with like a 45 degrees for the other side of the pick. I want something a little bit more, a little bit more rounded. And this is something I do. It, it's kind of do it by feel, almost do it like an, you know, feels it's fairly organic. So just start off on that 45 degree chamfer and then come over with like a rounding action. What I'm looking to do is get a rounded edge on the pick. So up to that glow in the dark material. So the core will kind of be flat and then rounded over faces leading up to it. So I'll blend in to the, the beveling a little bit more later. I just want to get the basic rounding done first. And for all this isn't part of the like the playing edge of the pick, this rounding is still I think is very important because this is where your your finger and thumb make contact with the pick. So you need a nice smooth 
smooth edge here, something that feels comfortable to, to grip, you know, no material getting in the way. So we'll get that nicely rounded over. And also make need to make sure that whatever we however we do it, it's uniform on both sides. Okay, and that generally looks good. I mean, to my eye here, it's a little bit rough, but this is only rough carving. We'll be going around with fine file, fine with fine files and sandpaper, and that could make quite a difference. The tip's a little bit rough, especially, but we haven't really carved the tip and profile that properly. Uh, what I'm going to do now is just grab a quick, uh, like a, a finer file, and just give it a quick once over, just to smooth out any really coarse marks of this file. Try and do this without filing my fingers or thumbs. Just easier said than done. This, like I said, this isn't so much to shape the pick. Really, this is just get, getting rid of any deep scratches from that, that slightly coarser file. That, that big file is great for taking material off, um, but it can leave some, some deep scratches behind. They're all removable through the, you know, the, the sanding stage but uh, taking them out with a, a finer file does help otherwise I'll be sanding forever right then so basic beveling done that's looking pretty good now the all important carving the tip so we're going to be taking the file over smoothing this over and rounding it getting a nice smooth plain profile and a nice sharp tip. Again doing this it's quite an organic thing just starting off on the bell and just moving the file over in a rounded motion just to take the, the point if you like off the, the top here. Leave that night avoid the very very tip because I want to leave that sharp but just taking that material off the top of the pick and then coming back the other way. So this first pass I can be quite aggressive, I want a reasonable amount of material off. I just need to make sure I don't like shorten the pick, I don't want to blunt it and take the very tip off. This is about taking material off, off the top here. So while I'm doing this I need to make sure I'm being uh, in uniform. So I'm going to do this just by eye really make sure that the amount of like, core material that I'm exposing on this side is the same as the amount of core material I'm exposing on that side, which I'm not. I need to take a bit more off here. And also I can just kind of do it by feel as I run my finger around. I can feel where it's curved or if there's any flat spots or like sharp edges or sharper edges where I haven't taken the, the material off properly and it's not properly smooth. Once I've got the basic shape, that's more or less there now. Nice and smooth, nice and rounded. I want a little bit more material off just around here. So do that, just put my, my file down and take some off the, off the top, taking care not to go down at an angle and take anything off the tip. And then blend, blend into where I've just filed. Because this is a quite a thick pick, we need quite a. I, I find works well with quite a, a decent amount of material carved away in the tip. Right, fairly happy with that. There's, there'll be more to come off when I get into sanding. I'll go around with a fine file in a minute, but that'll do for that side. Go around and do the same on the other. Now just going in with a fine file, just to kind of finesse that carving a little bit and to uh, get rid of any nasty scratches or more significant scratches from the bigger file. Okay, there's a 
first pass. That's feeling pretty good. So going around and basically just checking that everything's reasonably symmetrical. I need a little bit more off here. Again, this is the point where I need to stress that that clock that's running up in the corner wherever I decide to put it when I edit this video that clock that's running is basically to show how long this process takes obviously what this isn't is some sort of challenge where you know, can I make a pick in you know less than you know le less than x minutes or x hours that's not what it's about the, the stopwatch is there it's not a challenge for me it's a measure of how long it's taking I'm not trying to cut any corners here or or rush things if I ever make you know spot something that's not quite right I will go back and fix it rather than going ah no that's that's good enough I'm working against the clock I'm not working against the clock I'm working with the clock so I can time how long this takes okay At this stage, I think that will do. What I'm going to do now is get a piece of uh, sandpaper, uh, about 320 grit, I think I'll, I'm using, um, just to smooth this off a bit more, um, get rid of some scratches, and that starts to give me a much better idea as to how this uh, how this is going to going to feel. Slightly scrappy little piece of sandpaper, but uh, quite comfortable to hold in the hand and to work with. So let's get in there, going on everywhere where I've been with the file. And just smoothing off. So this, this is what this is. No, this is 240 grit uh, sandpaper. And basically this is coarse enough that it's actually doing a little bit of shaping it's taken it's, it's taking enough material off that this is helping to finesse the shape but the other thing it's doing is it's removing the scratches that were left behind by the files particularly around this part of the pick. And I haven't really beveled the this piece here. This is uh, pretty much flat. Uh, the, the faces of the pick blend into it, but I haven't uh, taken any material off there with the file. You can just use the sandpaper to make sure that that's nice and smooth. I've got rid of any, uh, any scratches from the file from when I did the basic shaping of this. Um, any last remnants of, of the epoxy glue that might be sticking through the the joints just making sure they're all nicely smoothed out and we've got a nice smooth natural organic organic shape the other thing with uh, sanding like this any scratches because i've just spotted one there any major scratches kind of fill in with the, the dust and make themselves a little bit more obvious so you know that you've got to go and give them a little bit of attention and uh, sand them a bit more and smooth them off a bit more. But being careful not to take too much material off because then you end up, the pick looks lop lopsided. Actually that feels a bit weird, I there's a little bit of, some of that's partly glue that's left over. Yeah, so that's got the feel of glue that's just spooched through the seams. Okay, that feels nice and smooth. That side, not so. This is definitely making a difference. So, so at this stage, there's the 240 grit sandpaper smooths this off enough that you can kind of make sure you're doing a decent job by eye, but you can do it by feel as well. Any, any pieces, any rough edges, actually you can just feel them with your fingertips. But that actually is feeling pretty good. Just gonna 
finesse the tip a little bit more. So this is the, the for me really this is the first time in the process where this now feels like a finished pick. It's got all the beveling, um, it's smoothed off. It's not you know when near as smooth and, and polished as it needs to be, but it's starting to feel like the finished article. Yeah, that is just a little bit on the thick side. Um, so what I'm going to do is just measure that, see what see what we are just as a, as a reference, and then I'm going to get some sandpaper and take a little bit of material off front and back just to try and make this a little bit thinner. Okay, calipers. I uh, don't know if you can see these properly. The battery is starting to go. So zero of those. Just for just for reference, this pick is currently 8.2 millimeters thick. So I want to take one and a half to two millimeters off that. So I'm just going to get a piece of uh, sandpaper. I got very little of the 240 grit sandpaper left, so I'm going to have to kind of improvise with uh, with small pieces. Um, this, as I said, is going to be easier now because there's only that area there rather than the whole area of the pick that we need to sand down. So I guess I'm putting that on sandpaper, a uh, bit of elbow grease and just keep sanding it away and try and do roughly the same amount of work front and back. Okay, so that's a bit of material off just for for reference. Let's see what that's done. About a tenth of a millimetre off so we're getting there so just do the same thing on the other side and just just keep going gets a bit monotonous with, with a pick that's not like the, the the width the standard width of a piece of material this is where a lot of the time and the effort goes in with doing it all by hand quite a lot of effort as well it's quite heavy on the uh, heavy on the arm muscles as this That's down to 7.9, so still quite a way to go. Um, to be honest, I was going to pitch for 6.5. I might do less. Just keep going, see how it feels, basically. Okay, so that's down to 7.67. 7 you know what, actually, that feels okay. That does feel okay. I could spend a lot of time taking this down to 6.5, but to be honest, I think that's all right. I think my main test now is going to be if I hold that up to the light and really kind of charge up the glow-in-the-dark material and then kill the lights... does enough of the glow come through the face of the pick? And I think the answer to that is yes. So that's probably, that's probably enough. Okay, so I think, I, 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 yeah, I'm just, I'm probably being a bit lazy, but that's, that, feel, yeah, that feels okay. That feels okay. I could go thinner, but um, the purpose of this video really is just to, to get an idea on the time it takes to make a pick pick in general I don't yeah I, I'll, I'll admit I am being a bit lazy but seven and a half seven point six mil will do so I'm gonna make one more pass around with the, the sandpaper just to finish off finish off the edges then we can go in with the wet and dry paper which gives us an even finer sand And after this, I'm going to go through with finer and finer abrasive papers, but it really helps for the later stages if, to go around and get rid of as many scratches as possible that this paper will take off. <laughs> Means I spend less time 
with the finer papers, which are, you know, the less abrasive, they take less material off. So for each grit, for each grade of paper that we use, get it to take off as much, as much as it can. Get it as fine a finish as it possibly can before we move on to the next grade. Okay, that I think is the 240 grit paper finished with. Clear a little bit of space and move on to the next papers. For the next stage, we've got an assortment of wet and dry paper. Because it's wet and dry paper, some water. This gets a little bit messy, so we got various grades of paper starting with uh, 600 so what this you can use say it's called wet and dry wet and dry paper or wet or dry paper you can use it wet or you can use it dry I find wet works better for a number of reasons um, it keeps the paper clear um, so it stops it getting too gummed up or bummed up with with dust so it keeps it cutting properly and also the the dust that comes off as you're sanding combines with the water and you get like a almost like a slurry and that all itself kind of acts like an a like an abrasive material and helps to get a, a smoother finish i find if you just use this paper dry it needs a bit more work um it just gets a bit more I don't know, a bit more scratchy, I guess, is the best way I can think of describing it. If you've worked with this sort of paper before, you'll know the, the sort of thing I mean. The difference between using it as like dry paper, so like emery paper, or adding a bit of water to the mix and just getting it, like I say, it's a smoother, smoother sanding action. When you get into the wet and dry papers, they say the scratches that they're leaving are, are progressively smaller and harder to see so it, it's it's easy to be tempted to think oh that's that's kind of that's as good as I'm going to get with this paper I can hardly feel you know hardly feel any roughness you know you need to trust that there's usually a little bit more to go so don't just kind of go around with one pass and think yeah that feels good enough you know spend a bit of time and this you know it's where the effort is in that final finish yeah, you put in a lot of effort into the final finish because that's what somebody notices. Um, there's a guitar maker that I follow on YouTube often says this, that, you know, the 99% of somebody's attention uh, will be focused on, like, the last 1% of the process, you know, just the polishing. So I need to make sure that that's as smooth as I can get it, ready to move on to the next stage. That's 600 grit. I'm going to move on. This is a very, very tatty piece of paper, but there's still, there's still plenty of material left. So that's dampen that, get that nice and wet, and go in with 1200 grit. So this is twice as fine as the 600 that I was using before. After the 1200 grit comes 1500. So this is a little bit finer still. The next, the final stage that I go to is 2000. It's the finest paper that I've got. That's a little bit too big of a jump from 1200. So having this intermediary stage of 1500 helps Rid of the, get rid of the scratches from the 1200 before we go to the final sand. So, lastly, wet up a piece of 2000 grit. So, this really is doing much more job. This would go through the, the papers. Uh, the finer and finer the take off less material this is very much about more like finishing and polishing type of sanding than it is about you know taking material off and actually shaping the pick in any way 
you know, really once you get beyond 600 really it just becomes an exercise exercise in polishing rather than in shaping I think that'll do for the faces so I think that'll do for the bevels around the edge now we'll move on and do the faces just quickly a bit of, bit of water just wet that paper and take the pick <coughs> and just sand it circular motion just to get the scratches off the faces so these really are the scrappiest pieces of paper but haven't find enough surface area to work with so we're down to the 1200 grit Fifteen. And lastly, two thousand grit. Okay, that's looking pretty good. It's feeling pretty finished, but it's got a wait, little way to go yet. We've got to give it the final polish. So let's put the paper to one side, and we'll get some polish and some polishing cloths. Right, for the next stage for the polishing, we're going to use this, which is Halford's rubbing compound. So Halford's, if you don't know them, if you're outside the UK, um, they're a company that sells lots of like car detailing, well, also so automotive and cycling things, but they do a lot of like car detailing uh, products. And that rubbing compound basically is for kind of finishing off um, paint work and getting it polished. And it works rather well on things like acrylic. So. What I'm going to do is just get a cloth, kind of wad that up a little bit. I think this says I should be wearing protection, obviously the usual stuff, but don't get this in your eyes or anything like that. Um, I think it's petroleum based by right, you shouldn't really be getting it on your hands, but I don't appear to have any, any protective gloves left, so I'm only doing one pick, so I should be okay. So load up the cloth with a little bit of the polish kind of feels a bit like toothpaste i often wonder if rather than using rubbing compound i could just use cheap toothpaste if this would do the same job it's basically a paste very fine abrasive paste and it does the same job as what the sandpaper and the wet and dry paper did it's just making scratches in the surface but the, sc the scratches that this stuff makes are so small and so fine practically invisible to the naked eye so they get really like a gloss almost mirror like glass like sort of shine and this is really quite transformative it always reminds me a bit of um you know if you've done woodworking that final stage where you put a bit of varnish onto a piece of wood and the grain really really pops it's a similar sort of thing with um with polishing the suddenly you cut through all of the the scratches on the surface and you get this beautiful uh it's like this like gemstone like finish so that's the face done a little bit more polish on the cloth we'll go around and we'll do the edges this isn't the final polish i've got one other product that i want to use just to give it the, like the final final polish but this really is the like the, very much the polish polishing stage um this you know, trans transforms it from super super smooth to actually being being shiny and particularly on the um, on the playing edge of the pick you want something that's as shiny as possible so when the pick hits the strings it it just glides over you know criticism people some have of um, some types of pick you know particularly acrylic um although it hasn't been so much in my experience as it has what you call like a chirp to it almost like you can hear the pick dragging across the string as you play and the way to get around that and i've had people comment on my picks specifically that they don't chirp and i think the reason that people notice that or that rather they don't notice the chirp is because i like to get this glass like gemstone like polish on the uh, on, the, on the, the the edge of the pick so it's as smooth as possible and just glides over the string and on the face of the pick as well, having it nice and glossy, acrylic's a really strange material in that regard, that the smoother it is, the shinier it is, 
you'd expect it to be more slippy, but there's something about just the way it, it, it kind of interacts with the, the skin of your fingers and thumb. The, the shinier it is, actually the more grippy it is, particularly if you start to sweat a little bit, you know, you don't need to worry so much about the pick falling out of your hands. A good shiny acrylic pick will actually be quite grippy. So that's why I like to spend a bit of time getting as good a polish as I can. So yeah, that looks really nice compared to the other side. There is a noticeable difference there. This is another stage. You know, could I do it in a fraction of the time by using a, a Dremel or some like bench tool with a, a polishing mop on? Yes, I probably could, but my picks are handmade. The only this is the only power tool I ever use as part of the pick making process is if I've got a pick that's got drilled grip holes, I'll use an electric drill to put uh, to put those holes in. Apart from that, everything is always done by hand, including the polishing. Okay, that's feeling pretty good. That's feeling pretty polished, pretty shiny. You'll see the light glinting off that. But I can take that one stage further, and for that I'm going to use some Brasso. Brasso, traditional metal polish. A bit of a household name here in the UK. Not too sure about where you are in the world, but uh, basically this is another um, just abrasive fluid. It's uh, a liquid with very, very fine particles inside, which give you that abrasive action against the material. So it's a cloth, just wet that ever so slightly. You don't need a lot of this stuff. Put the lid back on because that absolutely stinks. I'm sure this is stuff probably best not to get it on your skin. So I'm going to try and work fairly quickly here and not get too much of it into contact with my skin and I will wash my hands immediately once I've finished. Because as I said, all a polish does is make microscopic scratches in the surface of the material. That polishing compound, the cream, leaves very 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 small scratches but they are if you go in really 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 close and do really close inspection they are there are still scratches you can see on the surface the brasso has got a finer um it's like particle in it the abrasive particle is smaller so you get smaller scratches you get an even shinier even more polished effect so really this is just like a a really nice finishing touch, getting it as shiny as I possibly can. So here I'm using Brasso, uh, another sort of option for this, like this final stage for the final polish. And it's the sort of thing you would you would also find at your local branch in Halfords or, you know, car care shop of choice or something like Tea Cut. You know, where you've got a, just a, a like a, a liquid um, abrasive polish. T-Cut and Brasso are, are fairly similar. Okay, that is feeling pretty finished. So let's just clear some of this muck away. Get a cloth. Give this a final buff for you. Yeah, see how that's looking. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. That's looking finished. It's looking nice and shiny, like a gemstone, glass-like sort of finish there. So there we go. I'm just going to go and wash my hands. Back in a second. Yeah, just wanted to get the polish off my hands because, like I say, it's petroleum based. It's probably not good stuff to have in contact with your skin. But there you go. That's a what was this? About seven point six millimeter thick um, 
a little bit thicker than I was going for, but that actually is pretty comfortable. Possibly because it's a bigger pick than I normally, I'm used to playing the standard model, which is a little bit smaller than this. Um, this is the classic, so it's a little bit bigger. And actually that is about seven and a half mil. That feels pretty good. Um, as you can see the tip there, nice and sharp, nice rounded over. We've got the acrylic material on the face with the glow in the dark acrylic material in the core. If I just hold that up to the uh, to the light, get sort of get the, the glow in the dark material charged up. You can sort of see the glow in the dark material there, but if I turn the lights out, let the camera adjust the exposure. Yeah, you can see there's a bit of the glow in the dark comes through the face of the pick, which I think is a really nice, uh, really nice effect. Right, I'm I'm happy with that pick. Nice polished edges that should feel really good to play with. Um, how long did that take me? I don't know. I haven't been keeping an eye on the clock as we go, but there is a clock in the top corner, wherever whichever corner I decide to put it, when I edit the video. Yeah, it's not a quick process. Um, yeah, but hopefully that's kind of shown you what goes into when you make a pick by hand. It, it takes time, but I think personally, I think it's worth the effort because you do get a very nice, nice feeling, nice organic feeling pick at the finish. I've spent time shaping it. I've spent time polishing it, you know, making sure that all the scratches are out, making sure it's nice and symmetrical. So whichever way I pick it up, it's going to feel right in my hand. Yeah, it all takes time. And if you do choose to buy a pick, a handmade pick from me or from anybody else, um, you know, understand handmade pick there's a lot of work goes into it as you can see from the clock there this is how much time's gone into making this three ply pick yeah that's where the money goes it's because of the time the materials are a, a very small a, a relatively small a part of the overall the overall cost particularly with a pick like this where you've got the three layers and there was the the gluing and cutting and all of the extra work a one piece pick obviously will take less time but there's still an appreciable amount of time involved with the cutting and filing and sanding and polishing. So, yeah, just kind of show you there is a lot of time and effort goes into a pick because I want it to be as good as it possibly can be so you can enjoy it as much as you possibly can and enjoy playing it and enjoy playing guitar. And hopefully it will... I always, I always feel bad saying this as a music teacher. I, as a guitar teacher, I tell my students you can't make yourself a better player just through gear but hopefully a pick like this will feel comfortable and inspire you to play and make you a better player because of it okay there you go that's a 7.6 ish millimeter classic pick three ply white marbly acrylic faces with a glow in the dark acrylic core Okay, so thanks very much for watching that. I hope you enjoyed the process. Um, as always, please click like, uh, please subscribe if you want to see more videos. Uh, you're welcome to leave a comment. I don't always get notified by YouTube when people leave comments on videos or so if there's something specific you want to ask me about, picks, guitars, guitar playing, music theory, anything at all, you're better off going here, fill that form in, send your question in, that way it comes direct to me and I can get around to answering your question in a future video. Okay, that's the pick. There's plenty more like that uh, on my Instagram feed. I often feature uh, picks on my Instagram feed and, of course, at the Fatfish Picks store over on Etsy. If there's nothing on the Etsy store that uh, catches your eye um, but you are interested in a pick, then get in touch with me direct um, with a direct message and I'll probably sort you out with a, a custom order. Uh, okay, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.